Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here for a Killapalooza oh, oh, with I live uh, Fish Hunter Michael Kester. Thank fish you. Hunter Michael yeah, Kester. Do you like that? Yeah, I was a lifeguard. So before we even get into this today, uh -huh. we have an announcement that is going to change the future of, of double feature as you know it. It's true. Uh, it's life altering. Yeah. It's not life altering. Yeah. It's double feature altering. That's for goddamn sure. Everything is not boring now. It will pretty much matter to no one but you and I. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have two announcements. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is great. Full of announcements. Before that, what, uh, what are we doing on the show? Today we're going to do um, the Piranha franchise, which... A lot of people may not consider a franchise. Because oh, it's, it's a franchise. There's, it's five there's films, more than three, which for us But it's five is... films, which consists of three remakes and sure. two sequels. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there's a lot of fucking remakes. It might just consist of four remakes. That's true. That's possible. Arguable. Uh, so there's Piranha 1 and 2. Uh -huh. There's Piranha, uh, Piranha in 95. 95, which a lot of people skip over. Uh -huh. They go right to 3D, which right. is the fourth film I guess for yep. us and then three double d which just came out yesterday oh my god so that's the other thing yep. is this might be the shortest gap from uh when we watch and record yeah we just stopped watching the movies and now we're recording and the show goes up in 30 seconds <laughs> so there's chapters in the show and you rather than just skipping the movies we're going to spoil because we will spoil oh yeah every single individual one of the piranha yeah. films. actually um piranha the third piranha film we're going to cover spoils the first one and vice versa yeah we're gonna basically spoil all the movies yeah uh in every single chapter you can't avoid the spoilers unless you use the chapters to skip to the end i want to tell everybody about these two things okay and uh this might bore some people it, I, I don't know how it could possibly be boring because this is so fucking exciting. Uh -huh. I think it's better than the rest of our show today. But if I start to bore you, as I tend to... Just chapter right on over. the chapters. Skip. Or just skip about, I don't know, two minutes. The first thing I want to talk about is, should we talk about the lexicon or the hotel first? Um, Those are the two things I want to talk about. I think about. hotel. Let's talk about the hotel first because okay. that's something that the uh, Podmanity isn't actually going to get. Great. <laughs> you unfortunately missed out on this, but I just had a super executive meeting yeah. in a boardroom. I was at the end of the table, too. It wow. felt really boss. It felt super boss. We have been recording this show. So this is the thing that changes the landscape of Double Feature forever, but mm -hmm. no one will care about. We've been recording this show. Uh, five years yeah which by the way sidebar here i think that we have to be winning some award here yeah i think so too we have not missed a fucking show no. unless this one doesn't go up right for five goddamn years I mean, who has done that I no don't one's know. done that. stupid crazy people yeah <laughs> yeah right um there's shows that have been on you know seven eight uh, 25 sure. years but they can't have recorded every single week right yeah i mean that's nuts I'm going to just put out there now that we're the longest running consecutive week after week show on the internet until someone challenges yeah, me. Yeah, if you have a problem with that, there's uh, an email. We'll uh, get to that. It's at the end of the show. Okay. Don't email yet. Just chapter. All right, so here's the thing. We've been doing this out of uptown Chicago for mm -hmm. a long time. And I had mentioned earlier, uh, California, I think on our year-end episode, that I was debating a move out uh -huh. to uh, Cupertino, California. Right. And it was looking like you were definitely not going to California. Yeah, we were maybe going to do this uh, over the Skype or... Who knows? I, I didn't really know. Um, turns out, fuck that. I'm going to stay in Chicago. <laughs> but furthermore, we're going to get the hell out of Uptown with this studio. Yeah. We're done with Uptown. That's no longer a thing. Hashtag not a thing. But um, I found this hotel building... And I think, I'm, I'm almost 100% positive at this point, I don't know what day we're going to start this, but I think we're going to start recording out of the historic Edgewater Beach Hotel building. Oh, good. Which is kind of like the hotel in Innkeepers. Right. It's a big, kind of creepy, haunted hotel-looking building. Uh -huh. So I've been trying to smooth everything out to get us a spot to record there. Um, we'll see what happens. We're still in shitty uptown, as you can tell by the traffic sounds yep. uh, outside. But so that'll be that'll be huge for yeah. me and you, and not sure. for not for the internet. No one will care. <laughs> but it's going to be creepier and more awesome. Yeah, it'll be way better. Second thing, okay, the lexicon is going up. We got a plan for the lexicon. All the right. 
dictionary of double feature terminology. The stuff we say that nobody understands. Yeah, right. Hamster style and, uh-huh. and what have you. And we'll probably bear drop a no lot of bear. <laughs> bear or no bear. So all of these terms, they have a point of origin and they have something we at least think they mean. And we use yeah. them a lot and sometimes we explain them, sometimes we don't. One of our fans has written up a great, uh, just this giant body. He did work. He did work yeah. we didn't do. And now we're going to exploit his work for money. That's yep. what's going to happen. <laughs> so we've been asking for donations all this time or most of this time and offering basically nothing back to right. the internet. This is the year. And, you know, I put this on our Facebook and I sent out emails to a lot of people who listen to the show. Uh, this is the year I want to do all that fucking stuff we never do. Sure. All that. And I, I don't want to drop in all the stuff we talked about. Because right. I kind of want it not happen. <laughs> well, and I want it to be a bit of a surprise. Yeah. But we've talked about sort of double feature merchandise-ish sure. stuff. Right. Things you can pay for and then receive. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Something Things like we that. can send you. Things we want to do, maybe event type things yeah. or things we want to create. And uh, we're going to do that. This is the fucking year we're doing that. It's the year we're getting out of Uptown and it's the year we're doing all the goddamn stuff that you tell yourself you're going to do, but you get too busy and you don't fucking do. Mm-hmm. So we're getting together the money for that. We've somehow broken even on the server bill, Apple TV, all that stuff. We got that covered. Now we want to fund all those projects. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is, this is Killapalooza, it's donation time. We want people to send in money, donate.doublefeatureshow.com, and for every, what do we decide, six bucks? Yeah, six bucks. For every six bucks we get, we will add to the lexicon. We're going to put it up on the site, starting first fucking donation. Yep. First one. You could be the first one right now. Go there before you finish listening. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com, and every six dollars we accumulate, we're going to add another term to the site until the entire lexicon is up. For free on the site, people won't have to. I know we were talking about maybe do packaging yeah. it or do. Yeah. Forget about that. No, it's going to go on the website, and you don't have to donate six bucks. You yeah. can donate twenty bucks. You could donate three bucks. Right. But for every six bucks we get, right. for every six dollars we get, it's so going if up. you donate three, and then another person were to okay, donate get three. <laughs> Let's start uh, with the Killapalooza. Should we? Yeah. Donate okay. doublefeatureshow.com and Piranha uh, number one. The original Piranha. <laughs> the original pr- the Corman Piranha, the Joe Dante okay. Piranha. Joe Dante and Corman, right? So, yeah, so Piranha, Piranha 1, the original 1979 sure, production sure. of Piranha, is a film that you and I have had a lot of contention on for getting yeah, on the show. Sure. Um, I wanted to do it with Jaws because mm-hmm. it's notoriously one of those, one of the original rip-off films of the big box office, you know, Corman's big. Sure. And then I wanted to put it with Star Crash. Mm-hmm. Which is um, Corman's big ripoff of Star Wars. Yeah, um, sort of. But, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and you kept telling me, why don't we do it in a Killapalooza? Aren't there more than one? Yes. Aren't there more That's than- all, anytime I hear more than one, <laughs> in my head we have a finite amount of Killapaloozas, yeah. and I'm terrified. Well, and, but uh, fortunately this year it's uh, we get the uh, fourth Paranormal Activity, which safely places that in Killapalooza territory sure. now. Sure, they, you know, franchises keep appearing, uh-huh. and, uh, and then we keep finding out about other ones, too. So we have the first Piranha film. Yeah, and it's everything Double Feature likes in a movie. It it's really exploitative, is. it's Corman, it's Tits, it's Joe Dante. Well, and so the other thing is, so this happens every fucking time, uh, I guess with the exception of Saw. I always feel like we come up with Killapaloozas, and I go, Piranha. That's not really a slasher franchise. Right. Yeah. It's not going to feel like the other ones, but sure. fuck it. We're Hellraiser. running out of stuff. Hellraiser, yeah. I think, was one of the initial, this is not a, no, maybe sure. Aliens. Man, no, you're right. It is every single one. Yeah, it's every one, and we go, this is, Child's Play, that's not yeah. even a. Texas <laughs> Chainsaw, that's a chainsaw. You can't slash with a chainsaw. Right, <laughs> right, by very definition. Matthew McConaughey, take off that leg. But, uh, wow, the parallels, Michael, and they're uncanny. We start with the first Piranha. We do. And we're in the fucking 80s. Or, you know, it, yeah. it looks like 80s no, yeah. slasher well, it's film. it's 1979. It's right where it's, right. Um, it's after Black Christmas. It's after sure. Halloween. I mean, sure. the, the 80s teenage horror flick is in full swing. We're yep. just a year ahead of time. Sure. So, already, my fears, as they usually are, alleviated in the first. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the very first installment. And then, you know, female frontal just happening right away. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's definitely, uh, I have no qualms with calling yep. Prana a slasher franchise. I think that's beautiful. This movie, the tone of it, I think it's one of the things that 
I mean, that stood out to me in every in every installment of the yeah. Piranha uh, franchise. But in the first one, you know, you get that title card, yeah, the Piranha title card. This is not the martyrs come out dick swing and sure. you know land on the table title card right it's kind of somber and yeah sad it's depressing oh piranhas oh, are piranha gonna need us camp. oh bummer yeah it says bummer is what it does <laughs> but i think the overall tone of the movie i don't think it ever gets replicated in the franchise until the last one mm-hmm. um you were saying and accurately so that it seems like uh joe dante directed it on his lunch break he did yeah um that's a fact and uh that's not a fact it's so accurate though because we've seen so much joe dante on the show we haven't seen as much of the 80s joe dante sure. as there really is uh like the burbs with tom hanks yeah right right um but was that 80s or 90s i think oh maybe it is the 90s Use the internet we um, don't know but we've seen you know small soldiers gremlins yeah the big yeah. hitters the God, ones joe that, great, the ones that look like joe dante <laughs> yeah, right and, uh, right and they're fun but they're fun with this sensibility of terror yeah um small soldiers for as much bullshit as it gets and i i actually saw joe dante at the music box not too long great. ago that was the film that nobody talked about Really? Everybody brought up inner space. Everybody oh, yeah, yeah. brought up gremlins and Amazon women on the moon and sure. the burbs and all these movies he did. Um, and small soldiers gets looked over, but I feel like small soldiers is a perfect example of having fun with a subject, but it remaining dark and scary and maintaining this kind of serious, intense air. Yeah. Piranha doesn't have that. No. <laughs> Piranha no, kind of plods along and you end up on a raft and oh that dog is getting eaten and sure woo-hoo, there's dick miller well when you when you say things like dog gets eaten and dick miller <laughs> it's strange because the movie it looks like one of those 80 last house on the left yeah. kind of films yeah. sure but something makes it funny yeah and not in the way that you know you turn the sound off it's sound i guess that's the answer yeah. you turn the sound off you don't know you're not watching last house on the left right but uh, the score kind of makes it funny, and the um, it's just it's lighthearted. The yeah. humor element of it. There's also the inclusion of Paul Bartel, who we may have seen on the show before, mm-hmm. um, or we'll see him eventually. But he directed Death Race 2000. Oh, okay. And this guy is in inca- He plays the camp counselor in this. Sure. And he's incapable of a. So also role. acts or just does cameos. He acts, or- he acts a lot, almost exclusively in joe dante's work Beautiful. he was in amazon women on the moon oh yeah in awesome. the, uh i was a the sex fiend one at the sure, end sure. he was the one that showed her into the dungeon and whatever great he's incapable of a serious role so to put him in the middle of anything right. labeled horror immediately turns it into more of a campy corman-esque this will be a fun summer movie sure well you want to talk about camp and slasherdom uh, you know, the death curse guy is taken hostage. I yeah. mean, that's what's, we have that slasher element. We yeah. got a death curse guy. He's just, we're going to hit him over the head and bring him along on our raft, I guess. Right. So he can go on these long rants about how science is the fucking devil. Yeah. And he's that's, a scientist and there's no, no violence coming from him. Well, it's the, just, it's all the piranha. This is a weird thing. The efficacy of you know, weapon science. Sure. It's something that's uh, given the era we were in. I mean, hippies are blaming science for stuff. It's the late seventies or whatever. We got the, um, there was kind of that war of that stuff going on in the eighties between films that were completely Mm -hmm. anti-science sci-fi. And then in that same fucking genre, the other side of the, the cinematic war, the pro science movies. Sure. And those, I think in the 80s, they tended to be Probably aliens. Shrunk the kids. They were really alien-centric, I think. But yeah. there was that stuff, too. Yeah, you're right. There's there a lot the, of... There um, was the, you know, Back to the Future and yeah. Real Genius and My Science Project coming up against stuff like, uh, well, Reanimator and The Fly we did on the show, mm-hmm. right? So there's two movies that are... I don't, science gone awry. Yeah. The dangers of sure, sure. human discovery. They make science the enemy. I don't think Cronenberg or, you know, I'm, I mean, I don't even think Reanimator was really uh, fucking science is going to kill us all. I have a hard time believing Stuart Gordon was making any sort of grandiose statement about sure. the climate of science and society. Sure. He just likes when being around science. He doesn't a give a fuck. A severed head was, you know, you've seen it. There are far bigger ethical concerns in here than the science. That's not where, I mean, that's uh, the movie uses that as a little bit of a vehicle and that's made more apparent in uh, the third movie we'll talk about. But I mean, when you're, when you're thinking 80s slasherdom, you're thinking uh, summer camp and all these kids 
this movie basically just puts a camera in children's vaginas. Yeah. For, that's where right. I want to talk about efficacy. That's the terror. What did, who, did we not know yet that we could have um, consenting adults in a water film? Was that I, not... You know, I think it's, not, it's, it's less of a matter of uh, showing adult vagina. Sure. And more of a matter of raising the stakes. Because in a film where you have, ooh, scary man-eating fish are right. loose in a river sure okay uh you have two options and that's that there's a group of people in the river and they'll probably die but if you really want to raise the stakes put innocent children in the water sure. where kids love to play and i mean it's so you it's, just don't think it's about sex yet no i don't i think because i think it's not maximizing its potential but i guess that's because i'm coming at it from the the reverse sure I'm thinking about all the modern stuff and everything we've done. Right. And then I'm going, this is a movie where we're doing the exploitative, ooh, camera underwater, you know, the stuff yeah. we'll get in 3D right. and sure. 3DD. Well, the stuff that we get in Jaws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, going back to this and it's children. So right. we're just showing all these creepy underwater shots of children. Yeah. No, it eaten. is. It's weird and it's off-putting, but Joe Dante tends to do a lot of stuff with children. Sure. Not sexually. <laughs> sure. Um. Or intentionally sexually, right. anyway. Well, actually, yeah. not intentionally at all, according to, again, when I saw him speak. Sure. And I won't keep talking about it, because he only directed this one. No, that's fine. But, I, um, I want to know. He was saying that a lot of the things that happen in his in his films, um, again, Gremlins, Small Soldiers, the whole is sure. almost a children's movie. Yeah. That he does a lot where he deals with kids. Mm -hmm. Even in um, his segments in Amazon Women on the Moon, there's yeah. a lot of children involved. Sure. He doesn't like kids. He doesn't really? particularly think they're a good vehicle How for anything. How could you in after films. making so many films right? with them? You would he hate did children. Eerie Indiana. He doesn't yeah. have a th he doesn't feel like there's a theme of childhood in his work. <laughs> doesn't see that through it's line just, in his own stuff. Right. That's funny. It's just a thing that happens. He, somebody posed the question to him and he kind of reflected on it. Oh and wow, said, weird. I've never realized that huh, every single one of my yeah. fucking yeah. He said I've never thought of myself as a director of children, although they do this is the first time Joe Dante ever had someone talk to him about his work, apparently. Well, yeah, is... well, somebody also asked him what was in his hole. The second film in the franchise uh -huh. uh, is called Purana 2. The Spawning, I think, is the, the name of that. Killer flyers flying Oh, my God. Trues. So the piranhas have changed. Something. There's some piranhas in the last film, I guess. Evil I, has evolved. Something has there's survived. There's a lot of scenes of bubbles and water, and sure. I assume there's piranhas in there somewhere. Uh -huh. um, in the second film they can fly around. They have little uh, little whirly copters attached to them. Yeah. So the way that the piranhas are kind of portrayed in the first one is, I mean, they, they're they portrayed by bubbles. You see bubbles more than actual fish. Uh -huh. But they make that strange high-pitched sound. Hey, the piranhas are coming. Yeah. And uh, you get some stuff that kind of implies point-of-view shots of the, sure. of the piranhas. And then in the second movie... All of that stuff comes back. Yeah, it's all there. We're creating staples for a franchise. We're fading to red. Yeah. yeah. People are unsuspectingly being devoured. They even they even go so far as to have situations uh, where people are having sex and then piranhas. Yeah, right. Because when you think about a situation with piranhas, and we've already established that at the end of the first film that they can't possibly ever go into the salt water, and then there's that foreboding shot of the ocean, and it fades to red and piranha noise and so we have this fantastic opening for a direct sequel the piranhas are in the ocean this is where so many people are and they can get anywhere this could be a global animal crisis sure the likes of which we've only seen in south park's pandemic right and instead we have this directorial choice to invoke a deeper level of mischief making and man is god in science mm -hmm. I, don't, I mean it gets so convoluted and strange sure. well it has to i think it starts with let's up the ante right and then it becomes convoluted as a result yeah it's well how do we make the piranha scarier sure and that's how you have piranhas that start flying yeah. around it's judgment day it's a James Cameron film. Of course, we're upping the Annie. We're always upping the. That's how we got several aliens. That's how we that's... got several avatars. <laughs> Is that what in three D with extra scenes? That's how Titanic came out in three D with extra. That's how scenes. we got two Titanic films? That's right. Titanic Part One and Titanic Part Two that right. are usually packaged together sure. under the guise of one film. Yeah. 
We I'm should gonna... get a Titanic part two on yeah. the show. I'm still into sure. that idea. Yeah. Just the second part. Don't watch the first. I mean, you could just watch the first part, but Why if bother? those were two different films, just start watching Titanic on the second tape. Because I know you still have it on VHS. Yes, yeah, totally. <laughs> Maybe not you, Michael Kester, but someone <laughs> listening to this has it on VHS. Start with the second half. We could always pair up Terminator with Titanic Part 1 and Terminator no. 2 with we, Titanic I don't know Part if you two. remember this. We did Terminator on the show. That's right. With the prophecy. Why do you always have to remind me we did that? Whatever. I'm, I'm over it. I'm over it. You know, if you called it Piranha 2, The Flying Fish. Sure. Then I, or just Flying colon, Fish. Flying Fish. Yeah, yeah that would with be With an it. exclamation point. Yeah, right. Uh, then I would be okay with it because flying fish are a real thing. Sure. Um, when you just add wings to fish, uh, the well, spawning. I... You're you're forgetting the science behind it. It's not just adding wings. It's a hybrid of the most terrifying animal that the human mind can fathom. It's a combination of the piranha, the flying fish, and the evil grunion. Oh, yeah, the grunion. The grunion has always scared me because I've known what a grunion is yeah. prior to today or right now. And uh, it's always terrified me, let me tell you. It's definitely scary. Yeah. Don't so, know what we're talking so about, we... steering conversation. <laughs> Elsewhere, nudity, it's great. <laughs> Isn't nudity still in the film? That's great. I believe it is in the film. Big fan of that. This... Yeah, so we're talking about gene splicing, right? Yeah, well, we're talking about gene splicing, but the thing that's so funny to me is that in a film that's trying to up the ante, sure. and they're trying to create a super creature, right? They're trying to create a terrible beast. Yeah. So let's mix three types of fish together right. so that they can be on land, air, and sea. Well, and I think the idea was one fish is kind of terrifying, but three fish is three times as terrifying. Sure. Yeah, that worked out. If you can't go in the water, imagine if you can't go in the air or on the land. Or in a spooky outdoors. sunken ship. Right. That's also in there, too. Yeah. James Cameron's early fascination with the sunken ship. Well, he has a pension for deep sea diving. He did that, Um, what was the, uh, the, the documentary, documentary called? Thing. Yeah, yeah sure. he did the documentary after the abyss. Also, the fucking abyss. I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, what, 80% of his work is some sure. kind of underwater adventure? I believe Avatar 2 is supposed to be underwater. Oh, my God. So we're still spending a lot of time in the water. The whole oh, film works sure. just fine without flying around. Yeah. It's just an added element. Well, it's the thing. I think it's... um seems like it's going to be set up to have a massive body count. We get sure. introduced to all these weird characters. Yeah, a lot of them. Who don't even the get involved The kid who has a strange thing for his mom. Right, the Isn't old that lady. Weird? What's that about, by the way? I don't know what that's about. He eventually hooks up with that guy's daughter, the pirate's daughter. Yeah, does that make it okay? There's definitely a way. He means to tease his mom, but he's teasing his mom. It's awkward. Yeah. Super awkward. Well, and then there's the old lady who's hitting on the pool boy. Sure. Yeah. We have Lance Henriksen and his talking helicopter. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, because they can hear each other over sure. the motorboat, screaming back at a helicopter, yelling down. Okay, sure. Why not? But what it results in is just the forgettable characters get devoured before they hit the water. Then they hit the water. And everybody else has to run around a little bit more because they need to get indoors. Sure. Well, the, we have what is probably the hokiest scene in the entire franchise, the we want fish yeah. scene. Uh, that's what everything has Where kind of culminated to. they're literally asking for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. You have an angry mob demanding that fish fly out. Of, that whole scene would work if they took three steps forward. It would work underwater. We just didn't need the fish to fly. It's right. not necessary. It's just there to up the ante. I'm not, I mean, this is a slasher franchise. Oh, yeah. This is not me complaining. No, this is fantastic. And the thing that's, that's also really interesting about this as a film is, and this is probably a testament to Cameron's work, is that the character depth actually exists. Sure. Whereas the monster and the creatures and the ants from them, you know what I'm talking sure, about? Sure. They're just around sometimes. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. they're an unfortunate situation in this woman's life where she's trying to balance being a single mother sure. who's still in a small town this is the early with her version husband. of the Cloverfield thing. Yeah. The it's, 28 weeks later thing we talked really about. It's really not dealing with the piranha at a level that we, uh, well, I mean, honestly, have yet to see sure, um, sure. in the franchise. But the piranha is almost an afterthought. It's, it's kind of a motivation. For an unmotivated fish, they're very motivating right. for mankind. This is also the first time in the franchise it really starts being scary. There yeah. are scene, you know, the corner scene. Yeah. Which is, and this is so unique. Um, can something be so unique? I guess that's redundant. You know what I mean? We know that the fish is just in the water, 
we get in the coroner's office, we're terrified, but we it's as if you were afraid of Freddy but knew you weren't in a dream. Right. And you can never know you're not in a dream in that franchise, so that never happens. Sure. But we go, well, we're not underwater. Why is the corner? Is this going to be a zombie? And sure enough, it fucking delivers. The fish pops out. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> fucking flying fish. Attack some of our characters. Uh, some of them make it out alive in this movie. Some don't. But we surely get a countdown at the end. Yeah. So Cannot end the film without a countdown. Why are the Piranha films? So we've seen a we lot. We can't fade to red if we don't count down. <laughs> it's just that's elementary, Michael. We've seen a lot of horror franchises. And some of them do a very good job of bringing it back around. Again, I have to I have to champion Saw for this, but it's yeah. easy because Saw came out so close within itself. Sure. Every Saw movie ends with this fantastic moment where all the pieces come together mm-hmm. and that music plays and you know that it's coming down and that it's still not solved. Yeah. That's how all the Saw movies end. Yep. And Piranha's thing, Piranha's fantastic idea for ending each <laughs> film in the franchise uh-huh. is... Count slowly to whatever number. I can only hold my breath for this amount of time. Yep. Then go on the boat. I'll grab on this rope and you'll pull me out of this horrible situation before something blows up and inevitably kills every piranha because they're all right there. The end. Well, the third piranha film can't escape that either because it's a fucking remake of the first one. Yeah. So it has to follow the same. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to, but well, no, it does. When Roger Corman is producing that film as well. It has to follow. All right. I mean, I used the word remake, but yeah. okay. Roger Corman produced. Sure. Um, we've this done is more than a remake. We've done remakes. Yeah. On double feature, we did Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah. We did. Um, what's Usually, the... you can differentiate these as a remake and a reboot. Sure. Maybe that's or an a arbitrary... reimagining. That yeah. was a thing that recently arbitrary came distinction. Out. It depends how far away from remake sure. you get. This is uh, the other direction. This is something I've honestly never seen in my life. Hmm. And it's, what is that thing? They took the script and shot the movie again. <laughs> they just shot it again. And then spliced, like they found the script and yeah. didn't realize and that And then they, they already spliced made one. in the special effects from the first film. Sure, they yeah. just spliced them in. Yeah. It They um, changed the sound though. They did change the sound. We got rid of the staple sound. So that lasted a long time. Uh we have basically the same screenplay. Yeah. There was a screenplay it credits the original uh screenplay sure. and then says that it was adapted. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I mean... It was th- adapted to include that scene with the director and the topless camp sure. counselor. And it changes some of the genders of a couple of the roles. Yeah, but I mean, these are... We just named everything that, yeah. that was fucking different in the film. Some of the shots are lined up the same way. I mean, it's pretty incredible. You know, you and I hadn't seen it before. Right. That was, yeah, i We seen... were able to quote the film because we'd seen the first film. Yeah. It was using some of the same fucking dialogue. Um, it was amazing. It's like watching your friends reenact a movie you just saw. Right. She walks in and um, William Katz's character, William Katz, I don't know if you recognized him, but we saw him mm. way back on The Man from Earth. Oh, really? He's the history teacher. I recognize Mila fucking Kunis, though. Chick. Oh, yeah. She was in this, too. What is Mila Kunis doing in this film? Um, Being Weird. 12? She was in uh, Black Swan. She's in Robot Chicken. We talk about that all sure. the time. She was the one. So when we did American Psycho, yeah. and we, I think we mentioned there's a thing called American Psycho 2. Right. And it's this, you know, everybody considers it a bastardization or whatever. She is the killer, and she's, she's the, the, psycho. the lead in American Psycho 2, which also has William Shatner in it. Anything with William Shatner is fine by me. <sighs> Mila fucking Kunis. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you No, there. it's fine. I wanted to mention the scene where she walks in, the fixer, the finder, whatever, Yeah. Um, and he's frying up that fish. Yeah. Um, Cooking the cartoonishly whole fish. Right. Like you drew it in the fucking pan. Right. And then he, he sits down at the table. And she says she's looking for this guy and she's looking for these, you know, whatever. And I say, jokingly, did my wife send you? Yeah. Because that's what the character in the first film says. Sure, sure. And he says, did my wife send you? Yeah. And it hit us so hard at that moment that we had seen this. This is a fun game we can now play. Right. Highly quotable. I mean, I cannot explain how quotable this becomes. I wanted to mention the director as being notable for being the least notable uh, in the franchise. Sure. We have all these heavy hitters yeah, that we people do. will talk about. That's true. I didn't even consider that. Yeah, it's a lot of big names, but it's Scott P. Levy who did the third one who isn't really well known. Right. I mean, he did Men in White, which was <laughs> the most notable among his other sure. stuff. Th- that's the one with the poster? Not because 
um, anybody knows what Men in White is, but because people know what Men in Black is, right. and that's the only reason. Sure. Um, he directed probably about 10 things in a five-year span and then yeah. disappeared into obscurity. Well, and the other thing that's really notable about this film is that we're in the middle of our palooza here. Sure. And we're already on made for TV. Yeah. We've hit showtime. Yeah. I don't mean showtime in the grandiose, <laughs> we finally made it, kid <laughs> sense. You mean, show, you mean showtime in pre-bullshit days yeah, of showtime. Yeah, showtime, pre-bullshit, pre-Dexter. Yeah. Pre weeds, yeah. Pre people watch Showtime, yeah, exactly. Pre people were making adaptations of the film fucking Piranha, right? Or Showtime to proceed or proceed, depending on the time of night. Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, yeah, that's basically what this is. Well, and I guess in being a small screen adaptation, and it's the entire objective is to bring it up to date. Sure, like that needs to happen yeah. or whatever. But it's bizarre because it makes no attempt to do that other than shoot it in full screen. Well, I mean, it does, it does the thing where it, um, it talks about corporate America. Oh, that's right. Science. That's right. You know, now we're all mad at corporate America. It's 1995. It's no yeah, this, right. is, this is it's during a clear the substitution. Era. The guy yeah. who did the adaptation just crossed out science and wrote sure. corporate America in its place. Sure. Well, we also get all these, um, really really sharp jabs at the film industry and sure, uh, sure. uh with that director character where he's talking about oh i wish i could get a crane shot right, and right you know he's talking about you know you need this to be an extension of yourself sure. i mean we get these jabs at the film industry and an even tougher jab at the newsman that was at the end of the yeah, first film yeah. um it's odd being the smallest name director the one that speaks out against uh hollywood or maybe and, it's not odd yeah maybe it's easier for him because <laughs> yeah, he's right as he's hey, fuck you guys with your big movies right he's yeah. making films he's not james cameron he's no. not joe dante nope he's scott p levy the showtime creator sure. of that film roger corman commission sure. <laughs> right i mean roger corman decided it was his decision hey let's just reuse the special special effects and i use that term loosely sure, sure. to eventually the climax of the film where he is uh going to the smelting factory right they don't even hesitate to just throw in the smelting factory from the first film sure and then stick william Katz getting attacked by hand puppets yeah right um in right the just do it, it over nobody yeah. nobody's seen it it's fine don't worry about yeah. it yeah this is for the showtime audience michael not the 1979 audience well and the other thing that you have to realize is this is in that weird point in home video mm -hmm. where corman hadn't yet reached the point in new world pictures where he was putting films out on home video when piranha happened sure piranha was a grindhouse box office film yeah it came out in the theater the I reels were saying. printed and then yeah. it hit the trash sure and then for 15 years anything corman made was straight to video sure but anything he had made previous to that previous to like 85 sure. or something so he's just trying to get some of that video money That's, he's basically yeah allowed to make his film because at this point in time sure people don't have the dvd right of roger corman's piranha sure. he can essentially take any of his old films yeah and just do a script remake sure, sure. because he's making the home video yeah at this right point, putting yeah, it and on i mean TV. there's there's probably a lot of production reasons that go into sure. that i mean stuff i don't know about but you know you're thinking all right it's on showtime they're probably gonna fucking play the thing day and night forever right. they have the i assume the rights to it or yeah. whatever and you modernize it, and maybe there's a couple other, you know, backdoor dealing kind of reasons yeah. why that had to be remade. And that became Corman's thing now. That's why he's on sci-fi. I mean, sure. there's money in doing made-for-TV movies. Sure, right. And there's longevity in the films. And if you do it well enough, which, honestly, I don't understand why this film isn't a bigger cult hit. The third one? Yeah. Yeah. Because as much as it's just a complete ripoff of the original well and also tries to make the second one obsolete right. too don't forget that yeah, throwing true. the father son die. yeah it's saying hey uh that second one too you know what don't watch the first two yeah. films we'll just kind of combine all that stuff it'll be in this one and it's fine i mean it's it is equally yeah, it's great, as yeah. enjoyable yeah sure absolutely. It, it doesn't lack in any way sure yeah you uh you notice the humor kind of changes yeah it's still funny but it's a a sharper it's unfair to just say 90s humor as if well it's a tv humor right okay you have a that's wider more, audience that's specific enough i'll accept that yeah tv humor the only other thing and i just i have no awkward segue into this i wanted to specify that a dead cat in a bag is not the same <laughs> as bag cats okay i we haven't really set up rules for bag cat i can accept variations to it 
I think it has to be other fast food bags. Okay. Or maybe a Taco Bell box, but that gets way too close to the Taco Bell Chihuahua. That's true. So send us a picture of a cat in a Taco Bell box. Double feature show at gmail.com. Send us a picture of your cat in a bag and we will tell you whether or not it is bag cat. All right. That's enough of that. You know, if we don't open tomorrow, I'll lose everything. It's that simple. <laughs> so we should. Uh, I, I love that too. As if uh, there's no reason to challenge it because it's that simple. Yeah. That's just the <laughs> no one in this is the first time this has ever been brought up anywhere ever. No one's ever <laughs> gone. Well, hold on a second. Why would you why would you lose everything if you don't open Oh, it's a business. Well, I, I don't understand. You've business. never run a business. You, know you, you, couldn't, you yeah, wouldn't understand right. stocks and such. What the fuck? Piranha is the remake of uh, Piranha. It's uh, actually, I think it's called Piranha 3D. It's called Piranha 3D. Which is part of the misleading, do we yeah. count the whatever showtime yeah, thing. Exactly. You and I didn't even know if we were going to include that, but yeah. you have to. You oh, have you, to. I'm glad we did. I think once we set the bar at sleepaway camp film that doesn't actually exist, True. then that yeah, was pretty that's, much it. That's, that really ruined us for the rest of Double Feature, didn't it? <laughs> Did. We had those hand puppets going on in the last movie. We were, uh-huh. we were seeing the prana a little bit more. But the um, you know 3D has the the three dimensional popping out of yeah. you. It's got the CGI prana. It's got the close ups. I feel like it's the first one that really stars the prana. Oh yeah, it's the first one where they're prominently featured and uh-huh. you see them all the fucking time. Right. And the film just goes, these look goofy. Fuck you. They're prana. Deal with it. We're gonna look at them every five minutes. Right. And it's also the first film, despite the original film in the franchise, mm-hmm. to call out the Jaws thing. What do you mean? At the beginning of the film where Richard Dreyfus is fishing in the hat and he's singing the song. Oh, that's yeah. That's a Jaws reference. You have to... So I've seen Jaws once. Yeah, I've only seen Jaws a couple times. And I'm going to name drop a little bit here. Okay. I was... You know Mindless Self-Indulgence? Yes. They toured with sure. the Birthday Massacre and we're hanging out on their tour bus. And it was the only time I've ever been on a tour bus. So no big deal. It's not, you know, whatever. No big deal. But it is kind of awesome. But I saw Jaws with them on the bus, and they're a band, and it was after a show, and it was funny. And so I was kind of absorbed in the moment. I count Jaws as a film I've seen, and I try and talk to people about it, but I don't remember one fucking yeah. thing that happened in Jaws. That was my Jaws experience. Yeah, well, there's, the, I mean, basically, he, uh, the captain, from what I remember, and I could be wrong too, I don't want to be great. taken Both entirely. of us talking about Jaws don't know what happened in Jaws. But there's a character, there's a a captain character and he's you know the the hardened he's basically captain ahab oh right i thought you were going total bro with this no 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 no. okay he's he's not a total bro no not yet those didn't exist the film goes zero to bro in (laughs) probably as much time as it takes for that intro song to turn into tits sure we're talking about um piranha again yeah uh, right and richard dreyfus's character in the beginning when he unleashes the earthquake that yeah. Bereads the piranha. So we're once again going, hey, Jaws, remember Jaws? Yeah. Remember we were ripping off Jaws? Sure. Now we're doing a remake sort of thing, continuation of the film yeah. that's not actually the third installment of the franchise that ripped off Jaws. And the other thing that this film goes back to is fun teenage fucking movie. Sure. Only sure. this film takes it so far beyond where anybody would have expected it to go. Yeah. I mean, this film is tits. One of the main characters is a porn director. Yeah, right. Uh, we've seen this in Hatchet, yeah. and that was nothing sure, compared sure. to Jerry O'Connell's character. A lot of nudity in oh, this yeah. movie. A lot of nudity. Well, and so the weird thing is, I don't think about this one having the most nudity, because it's not the most fun nudity. No. Well, and this might be a weird hang-up I have. Most people, maybe they watch this and they don't notice. Sure. Right? I don't know. But this is... There are bros. Oh, yeah. Bro city. Oh, Even yeah. Eli Roth is a fucking bro yeah, well, in this he's, movie. He's perfect because he becomes the caricature. Yeah, right. Uh, he's he's you and I doing our impression of when we accidentally end up at this party. Sure. <laughs> yeah. We come yep, back and we tell the other one about what it was like. Yeah, whoops. And we say, oh, yeah, the weapons of masturbation. Oh, yeah, Willy right. Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, ladies. Oh, God. And we're, the other one is sitting sitting there horrified with a furrowed brow sure cocking our head like brandy the dog uh, yeah a little bit Gross. confused <laughs> well and there's that thing about satire right yeah. that uh in order for it to be effective it has to at least be distinguishable from the thing it is yeah. satirizing and this film walks that level but it does it during the portions of nudity sure so in being satirical of this stuff and it's alex Eha and um yeah. 
you know, he did, we talked about high tension yep. and we covered him extensively on that show, but I, I love him. One of my favorite splat pack guys, if oh, yeah. not my favorite, depending on who you include in sure. that. Right. Adam Green's great. And you know, we, we talked about all these guys. I love Neil Marshall, I really Eli do. Roth. They're all my favorite yeah, splat yeah. pack. Character. Eli Roth is fucking incredible too. But I mean, of the lesser known of the people we kind of discovered as we sure. were doing this show, Alexander Aha is awesome. Yeah. So I can speak no ill of him. But then we have, uh, you know, what I'm really looking at in a slasher movie is this fun, carefree sort of, it's objectification of women, but not really. Yeah. Everybody's just having a fine well, time. It's, it's just nudity. There's, there's the kind of thing where you can objectify women. And then there's the kind of thing where you hire porn stars to be sure. the featured nude players. Well, sure. And that's, that's a whole different level of exploitation. That's almost reverse exploitation. Yeah. If you're hiring people whose job it is to be naked, oh, you and are now and exploiting them in a the audience. Film. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? It's when the Suicide Girls made a horror sure, film. Exactly. It's yeah. exactly that. Somebody says, oh, Piranha's a movie where they paid some chick to go topless parasailing. Sure. Um, or well, that's a, that's a really good example, right? Sure. The uh, windsurfing, I think. Yeah, that windsurfing. Maybe it's not that's windsurfing. What I think, I don't know. Water Whatever sports don't fucking know. Yeah. Have no idea. But in a movie where all the women are sexual objects and all the men are fucking gross. Yeah. And there's maybe, I mean, Kelly might be the only real person. Yeah. I don't know, at least among the younger kids. You get to this scene after I feel kind of gross and dirty about uh -huh. all the stuff that's making fun of a girl's gone wild. Yeah. You get an actual porn star and it looks like she's just having a fun time. Yeah. And it I don't know. Like, it looks like, oh, this, oh, I get it. This beach party is for porn stars. <laughs> right. And when you find people like porn stars hanging out and windsurfing or whatever. Sure. When Gianna Michaels has her tits flapping in the, that shot in 3D, yeah, see that by the way. Is oh it good my God. It's so amazing. This film, honestly, is the only film I've ever seen in my life that 3D was better than I it might be ever convinced to try that experience. You know, when, when we watch things and they could be in 3D, we don't yeah. even consider sure. doing that. Because I'd have a fucking hernia. My my brain would just mm -hmm. explode. But uh, I might be able to be talked into it's a watching blast. Um, Piranha in 3D in 3D. But you get back to those characters. There's, what's the opera piece called? Um, the flower, the flower duet. duet. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's supposed to look really classy by comparison. And that's the joke. But then you come back to the director and it's... You know, like fish with boobies. <laughs> if fish looked like this, I'd fuck fish. I just can't be around that fucking guy. It's um, Girls Gone Wild. I mean, it gives a bad name to pornography. Oh, yeah. You and I have name dropped stuff that kink.com does. Sure. And, you know, everybody has their own flavor of pornography. Yeah, but everybody also has seen pornography. I uh, I just think, like, the kink stuff we talk about, it's not even really my particular fetish or no. anything. It's just really fun. Well, you know so I mean? we, we, we talk about porn the way we talk about films. Yeah. I tend to find myself engaged in conversations about films that aren't my favorite, sure. but are certainly doing more interesting yeah. things than my favorite films. Because, I started buying a lot of films I don't even really like sure. because they because, do interesting stuff. So, I mean, it's no secret Devil's Rejects is one of my favorite yeah, movies, sure. and I could talk about that at length for hours, but the films that people end up wanting to talk about with me are films like Martyrs, sure. films like Irreversible, right. films that do things that movies just don't do. Pontypool yeah. is another yeah. example. Yeah. These are movies that people are engaged in because they're interesting, and that's why we talk about the porn we talk about, because when we're out and we're being social, we're talking about what's interesting. When we're home and our cock is in our hand, <laughs> we're just watching what we like. Yeah, sure. So the reason I mention any of this is because, you know, to get back in the world of cinema, Derek, in mocking that kind of Girls Gone Wild entrepreneurial thing. Wet t-shirt type guy. Yeah, it, he's one of the most reviled characters oh, in yeah. any of these. You know, you get the character you're supposed to hate, mm -hmm. a character we've long discussed, an archetype we've long discussed sure. in horror films. And come films. to know and love, really, a lot and, of the time. Uh, and this is one that I can't even get behind identifying with the fact I'm supposed to be sure. rooting for this guy to die. He's the I worst. Just, oh, God, I fucking hate him. Yeah. I hate his stupid, smug little face. Every time I see it, I fucking hate him. They took my penis. Yeah, even when that happens, it's not fun. I'm just, no. get, get away from me. I, I fucking think, hate you. Go I away. I think one of the funniest parts in the Piranha franchise, at least to this point, because mm -hmm. you and I both know what happens in the following film, but... By Piranha 3D, I think the funniest moment for me is when 
he comes back from the brink of death sure to say wet t-shirt and spit blood (laughs) yeah disgusting and then dies yeah it is really funny i think part of what makes that death um i don't want to say unsatisfactory because it's the whole thing is it's pulled off uh in the perfect way Mm -hmm. it's doing that archetype i mean total by the book way yeah uh but just showing that's aha's thing in this is just going i'm gonna do one of those classic slasher movie make you hate this guy and then execute him yeah but man it is uh he gets to me that's the thing it's showing that pulling off the toenail scene Mm -hmm. it's that cringeworthy thing and it totally i mean aha's doing by the book as good as it could possibly be done yeah he creates the worst character in the fucking world and then he kills them in a way when i see it it's not even so much the cock shot at the end. I mean, that's over the top and great. Yeah. You know, the burp thing and all uh-huh. that. But just looking at the bloody, jittery stump legs. Yeah. That's about as gross as I think this franchise ever gets for me. Sure. It just, man, I see that and I can't even, I can't even revel in his death. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the film takes it to that level that makes it notable for me, which is the massacre on the beach. Sure. Yeah. Um, the pool party, I don't know there, we could come up with a hundred different names that sound like slasher films, Yeah. but basically the 26,000 gallons of blood. Sure. Uh, everybody dies a horrible death. Let's yeah. use a bunch of amputees to make it work thing. Yeah. This scene. So that was a scene with amputees. Oh yeah. The, the, the scene, um, it's mass carnage, man. Yeah. I where mean, people, it's, it's their limbs are falling off. The girl gets ripped in half. Sure. People. I mean, all of these, people who have got their arms just chewed off and everything sure. looks so fucking gross and real and horrible. Perfect. Yeah. It's horrible all, and gross and perfect. They used amputees it, much akin to the way um, freaks use freaks. Sure. Yeah. We talked um, about that. That was uh, the straight story. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. That was a great fucking show. Um, but they use real amputees, which gives them the ability to have these people have missing limbs or get ripped in half. And do it all without the obvious either burying half of their body in the sand or using some green screen suit. It also looks the best of yeah, anything sure. you know, in the franchise. Even what came after, I mean, you don't quite get you don't get the same kind of bloody carnage no. ever well, again. Th- it's amazing because this film is the most over the top when it comes to characters and when it comes to the ridiculous plot and when it comes to the use of Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. But it doesn't detract from the realism of the violence in that scene. Sure. That scene is horrific. Yeah. That scene is grade A Alex Aha splat pack. Well, my favorite thing about it is in doing this kind of mass carnage scene, it's a spectacle itself. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Uh, the fact that we just have such a high body count. Okay, so that's something you and I see and go, aha, notable, point. But uh, also creative. If you're doing a movie and you care about this creative death thing, which in a lot of, you know, that started to become the Jason thing. That was everything Saw was built around. Right. Is, oh, people want to see all these strange, different, gruesome yeah. deaths. Final Destination. Yeah, right. Yeah. You that, get here and, all that is. you know, we're killing people left and right, but they're not just all getting gnawed on by piranhas. I mean, that happens when they fall in the water. They get gnawed on by piranhas, but we see that that's just the backdrop that sure. fills in every, that's the background of every other fucking death. That's why stay out of the water, but yeah. that's not the only way you're going to go. Well, instead of the water doesn't even work. And see, we don't need flying a uh, fucking yeah. piranhas here. We have, you know, that, that wire dismemberment thing. That's yeah. my favorite death in the whole fucking franchise. I love that. That's Ashlyn Brooke. That's another porn star. Oh, that's great. Just wire whips around, just cuts her in half at the chest. And the movie's perfect about taking just enough time to kind of go, here's what happened, and you know what's coming, and there it is. Yep. And then, you know, it gives you that nice little, the cherry on top bonus of, oh, let's get the water, the shot from underneath sure. as the other half slides into the water. Yeah. It's the perfect amount of time to consider each of those. Yeah, I think my favorite death, again, to go back to Eli Roth, is when he just gets his fucking head smashed by that boat. Sure, that's a good one, too. Because, for me, that scene is about panic and terror. Mm -hmm. And, like you said, the piranhas are just reaping the rewards of these terrified kids. They're all falling into the water, but they would be okay if they would just remain not freaking out. Right. Instead, they're killing each other and ripping each other's faces off. Sure. And the result... Well, the immediacy of that is, I think, what makes it... You know, very often we'll talk about 
oh, we like the brutality, we like the Rob Zombie, we like the smash the head in and keep smashing, and why are you still, seriously, please stop, can we go to another scene smashing? Uh-huh. This is just, Eli Roth is alive and, oh, oh wait, no, he's not alive, and moving on. Yeah. And just the immediacy is just as bad. You you basically don't want the, <laughs> I just gave the movie all this credit for making the deaths perfectly timed, but when you do something where you don't take enough time to consider it, you either spend way too much fucking time there or on the other end of the extreme, just instantaneous and dead and head is severed and he had no final thoughts. Yep. He just, bam. Uh, the impact that that makes is uh, fantastic. My other favorite one is the, well, where are the parents, chomp? Oh, yeah. And it's not quite as immediate and it that's one that timing, I mean, it's almost comedic timing. You know, I guess that's exactly what it yeah. is. This is a movie that is just as funny in its kind of modern horror splat way as any of the movies have ever tried to be funny in their other ways. Mm -hmm. That's what it's using for its comedic element. And that's another one that's perfect as far as pacing. Just enough time for everybody in the audience to make the connection. Oh, he's going to get... Oh, he just got eaten. Yeah. Perfect. Um, if you want to talk about brevity, though, you mentioned Christopher Lloyd was in this movie. You just glossed right over that. Well, so does the film. Yeah. <laughs> the film kind of goes, oh, yeah, we have to go to a fish doctor. Oh, wow, it's Chris- is that Christopher Lloyd from Back to the... Oh, bye. <laughs> yeah, right. He gets his one fucking scene. Yeah. And such a... Uh, we had enough money to pay Christopher Lloyd for yeah. one scene, and now he's gone. We'll see you in a couple years when John Gulliger comes out with the fifth and final installment of at least this Killapalooza. Yeah. Grunion 3 Double D. 3 Double D once again throwing off the fucking naming scheme. Yeah. Uh, the fifth movie. You got it. That's Although what I'm going to latch on to. Easily one of the funniest plays on 3D I've ever, ever thought about. <laughs> 3 Double D? That so did it perfect. for you, huh? Yeah. Well, you get these, um, what is it, Halloween. The thing that pisses me off is when it's the third film and it's Halloween 3 D. Yeah. Right. You know? Spy Kids 3 D. Too obvious for you. I don't like it. I like 3 Double D a lot. And I also, in saying that, this is easily my favorite one in this franchise. I think so, too. Nails I think it. so, too. They all have different spots in my heart, but this one uh, has spots in other places in my body. <laughs> well, no, I mean, so this is what I'm talking about with the nudity thing, yeah. right? Whereas Girls Gone Wild itself is cynical, and so a satirization of it that is too close to the original also seems cynical and just ruins my fun day at the beach. Yeah. This movie, total opposite direction, just fucking perfect. You know, the idea of water certified strippers, way hip. Oh, yeah. Such a good... Someone tells me that idea, and I know the movie. I know what it's doing here. It's going, oh, we took this good, clean, wholesome, fun water park, and we're turning it into dirty. Dirty, dirty, dirty. Just terrible, sinful, dirty. I like terrible, sinful, yeah. dirty. I like this guy. I mean, he's kind of, like, gross. But you know what I mean. He's <laughs> yeah. he's a gross guy, and he might be kind of cynical. But, but he's... See, he he is the character that Derek wasn't. He yeah. is the one that you love to hate because sure. you know he's always going to make the wrong decision. Sure. But it's, sure. I mean, and not to get to the end too quickly, uh-huh. but the pinnacle moment for this guy is when he throws the money at the little girl crying sure. over her dead mother and says, it's right. not my fault. Sure. Then backs over her with a golf cart. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's so perfect. Just the sounds and the whoops. Yeah. And you know he's going to make the wrong decisions at every turn, yeah. but you're so excited for him to do it. Well, and I love that the the fucking lead comes in, and she obviously doesn't agree with his choices at this water park. Sure. And he basically goes, listen, I know you're upset. You come in here, you see these strippers where we used to have you know good quality lifeguards, and I've taken a, a very extreme direction, and I'm showing all this nudity here, and I know you think this is a dubious idea. Let me just show you the fun room over here, the adult pool. Yeah. This is fucking worst idea ever. What are you, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Somebody just caught you making a, what they consider a, a reprehensible moral choice. And you go, wait, 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 wait. You haven't even seen the adult pool yet. Well, it's, it's the Marilyn Manson method. Yeah. It's, oh, you think this is bad. You ain't seen <laughs> nothing yet. Sure. And then, and born then in Bill retrospect, out, when you walk back out of the adult pool uh-huh. and you're back to eat me, drink me, you say... Oh, this isn't so bad. Yeah, right. I don't know if you're describing the shock rock element of Marilyn Manson or the how bad Marilyn Manson's <laughs> albums element of Marilyn Manson have gotten. Um, pretty clear. It's the <laughs> latter. <laughs> so yeah, he's still a slime ball, but something about the movie just the the cynicism doesn't appear there at all. I think because it's not as much profiteering. Yeah. You know, nobody really seems like uh, they're being used or taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. 
these are people who they're strippers and they're water certified and so they found themselves a place in the world they found a unique niche it's not to say it wasn't consensual before because it is but there's this thing in arrested development made the same commentary about girls gone wild uh girls with low self-esteem was their their right. take on that these girls who are young and they don't know what they're doing and they're drunk and they're on vacation and they want a free t-shirt or you know they're mad at their fathers or whatever reason sure. so there's that way to look at it that goes well, you're kind of taking advantage of someone in a place where maybe they're not able to make the right choices or whatever. You're taking advantage of someone, basically. Strippers who are lifeguards, no taking advantage of there. It's yeah. just everybody is having a fucking great time. Camera in a pool that we label as adult pool and people know what they're getting into and it just shows vaginas as you're walking upstairs. Brilliant idea. You pitched this idea to me. And I suddenly want to be a part of every sure, single aspect of it. it seems like something that could actually be a viable business idea. Unlike this film, which was just hated. A hated Not a viable film. business idea? No. I love that this just came out the other night. Oh, I yeah. I think that's great. It's so perfect. And we I never get to do this. I don't think that... I think that we need to... We have a responsibility on Double Feature here, Eric, mm -hmm. to champion John Gulliger as a director. Because nobody seems to get him... And that seems to translate through media as him being bad. Okay. Now, we've we've done I'm Feast. I'm going to let you do the hard work on this. Sure. Oh, Feast. Okay, so he did the hard work. Yeah. He made Feast. Feast is awesome. Yeah. And then we've, we didn't cover them on the show, but Feast 2 and Feast 3, we've seen, I love, you enjoy very much. Sure, sure. They do these ambitious things that are akin to the kind of movies that people hate. Something like... Scary movie. Sure. Something like, I don't know what, Meet the Spartans. I don't know. They have, I haven't seen it, but <laughs> they have this, this sense of humor that is so outrageous and over the top that a lot of times I think it gets written off as a cheap joke. Um, sure. We saw a lot of it in Chillerama. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where they're doing something, but because it's a giant sperm, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Yeah. It comes off as, oh, this is, this is a little bit, you know tasteless yeah tasteless that's the word um yeah. but i think that the motions that john Gulliger makes with the feast movies and especially with piranha 3 double d sure is less about being tasteless and more about taking a film who is precedented on being a film about tits and partying sure and really doing what piranha 3d tried to do which is call it out oh for yeah being totally, this man. scummy bro thing i mean yeah. it gets it where piranha 3d came at swinging and yeah. then just got violent yeah piranha 3 double d knows exactly how to make fun of yeah. the subject matter sure and still create a film that is so enjoyable mm -hmm. and so funny and so f i i hate saying words like this but it's such a fresh horror movie yeah it's not something you see you you've never seen a john Gulliger movie if you've never seen a john Gulliger movie yeah i'd agree with that and i mean feast is obviously the place to yeah, start even now feast yeah. is still, it's never uh, been done yeah and no one seems to be feast making these films like that too yeah. and it's it's translating into oh he's a terrible filmmaker but what it really is is i just don't think people get the level sure. he is at what's the origin point you got to yeah. think about the origin point now if you and i were here and if we just made a film like that people might go it's tasteless sure but if we come on the show right now and everyone hears us have a conversation about tasteless films mm -hmm. hey what are names some tasteless films and we talk about it a John while Waters and, and yeah right well that's yeah that's really highbrow stuff for tasteless yeah but, you know we could just start talking about what is tasteless and then kind of making fun of it and then we go well what's the most tasteless thing you could come up with it's like doing the aristocrats yeah, basically right and then we hit upon an idea and go sure that's, that's so fucking tasteless i can't it's, it's hilarious how tasteless that is yeah yeah it, it, you start moving back up into the high high level sure. the the really deep rooted thought experiment of tastelessness right and that becomes very brilliant art again well yeah we could get to a point feasibly in that conversation where we find something that is hilarious in how tasteless it is sure 
and then we make it into a movie. And then you put David Hasselhoff in it. I think that's I think that's where this film resides. Sure. I think he knows what tasteless is. Oh, I yeah. think Piranha's done the work for him oh, yeah. over the various films in terms of levels He's of tasteless. He's certainly making a Piranha film. That's yeah. what's well, that's, going on here. This is a Piranha sure. movie. But I just feel like his work is aware of other horror movies and isn't just making a commentary on it, but it's going, okay, That's the, it's the same fucking Chillerama thing. It's, you know, that sperm movie was looking back at, okay, these giant monster movies and then the tastelessness in horror films. Right. It was doing more of a commentary, but it was basically saying, how tasteless could we go? What's the most tasteless thing? Sure. I mean, World War II Frankenstein, you know, this, uh, this conversation you have beforehand that people don't see, mm -hmm. I think it really sets the context and that could just be you and I reading into it, but I really get the feeling that he's operating on that higher level. Not even necessarily satire, right. but just going, tasteless things are really funny. Wow, this is the most tasteless idea ever. I'm going to put that in my movie, you know? And this film, again, we've, we've said the word over and over again, but God damn, is it tasteless and hilarious. Yeah. And all in one line. <laughs> Is that Josh cut off his penis because something came out of my vagina? That's the is that one. the line yeah. you would think of? Yeah. Wow, I'm so glad. We're, we just have a fucking psychic connection. <laughs> we should be applying for the Randy Million Dollar Prize wow. right now. Uh, but we won't because we don't actually have a yeah. psychic connection. If you have a psychic <laughs> connection, jref.org. I think I told you. I went to the amazing meeting. Yeah, but you told me that you were going. Is, and yeah, then I never this heard is way else. old news. We never got to talk about that. And this is probably not the right place. No. Josh cut off his penis because something came out of my vagina. Yeah, this film has piranha pregnancy. Yeah. I mean, if you think monster movie and you're trying to be heinous, have it come out of a vagina. Yeah, right. That's the answer. That's, That's the That's fly. It. Yeah. If you really want to make people uncomfortable, have a human give birth to the monster. Sure. And then have it bite a cock. I, I don't remember that scene from the fly. It's the poetry of the flesh. So another thing that we need to note about Piranha 3 Double D, aside from its wonder and its heinousness, is that it's, of the five films, it's the second sequel. It's the yeah, first movie that's yeah. a sequel, second movie that's a sequel to its predecessor. Sure. First one, sequel, reboot, 3D, whatever the fuck reboot that again. is. And then, and then yeah, another it's kind of sequel. a reboot and kind of a sequel. Sure. Yeah. And then the that's probably another part of the 3 Double D mechanism sure. is... Uh, we don't even really know what number this is. Right. It's just, I don't know, three, three double D. But it gives them an excuse to bring back characters without legs, characters who died oh and for some God. reason returned. Ving Rhames, who was in the last sure. movie. Ving Rhames was just being a boss in the last movie. And this movie probably has the most demeaning <laughs> role I've ever seen him. Yeah. We're talking about the guy from Pulp Fiction. The man. We're talking about Marcellus if, Wallace. If there is a man from Dawn of the Dead, uh, Snyder's take on Dawn of the Dead. Sure. Then Ving Rhames is the right. man in that movie, too. He, and, and he plays and, that character. And there's also the tournament where he just plays the fucking boss, too. Yeah, right. He's always the badass motherfucker. Sure. Totally true in Piranha 3D. Not true at all. And he whimpers. He, he has does. dialogue. He doesn't where he's want to go in the water. Whimpering. He hates that fucking water. Oh, my God. I feel bad for him. But, I mean, way to go, Ving Rhames, for just not not being typecast i guess no. i don't know carrying over his character it's... i feel like this character coming back the way he does is so brilliant it he comes back and he's broken and he doesn't want to go in the water and sure. he's having all these flashbacks and then the previously carnage... on piranha flashbacks right, yeah. right and the carnage starts happening and he starts to run away and he goes no I can fucking face this. And he puts on his titanium legs yeah. equipped with a shotgun that he saved. He bought using the money he saved from socks. Obviously. And uh, he just starts shooting the fuck out of these <laughs> right. dinosaur fish. Yeah, probably kills at least three. At yeah. least three and of them. everybody's in awe. And by everybody, I mean the dude who pushes his wheelchair, who I'm pretty confident died in the first film. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? Um, but he uh, he really comes back in a way in this film that... Only, again, and I know I've already said it, but only John Gulliger would have the idea to sure. bring back the badass sure. as this sad guy in a wheelchair. Listen, and I know I call out previously on all the time uh -huh. when people fucking recap old movies. And, you know, I'm going to stop getting down on films for because that's just I expect that. And at this point... I've gotten, not only am I over it, but also I'm mad if it doesn't happen. Yeah. It's like going into space, always a terrible idea, but always a great idea. And if it doesn't happen now, I'm angry. We never got to that point. 
um, how ballsy is it to have the movie that's basically the direct to DVD sequel uh-huh. go? Oh, people probably didn't see the wide theatrical release of Prana 3D, which yeah. was one of the most successful pieces of this franchise. Let's let them know for the viewers who only go to Redbox and don't go to sure. the theater and perhaps did not see the original. Like, fuck you, movie. No one saw this movie. <laughs> Everybody saw the other movie. It's just so ballsy. Well, I like I think that a lot. I, I hesitate to say that Christopher Lloyd saw the first movie. Or maybe he did, because he is know. back with a vengeance. Back on the YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that Christopher Lloyd is a meme. 700 more views than Laughing Diarrhea, baby. Ain't nobody got time for that. He comes back as the character that he gets the screen time that I wanted him to have yeah. uh, in the first movie. I would have accepted if his role was recast uh, by Boxy, but, you know, not available for the film. So we get Christopher Lloyd back. Uh, we pay him, I assume, in lunches for this uh-huh. film. Do you think he costs less for this film than the last one? Is that what happened? Did they have I'm more budget? I'm curious if somebody somewhere along the line got a hold of his his daytime Emmy from Taxi. <laughs> and they're just handing happens. it around Hollywood. And he gets wind of who has it. And they go, yeah, be in my movie. I'll give you your Emmy back. Right. People but just he never had, they never have the Emmy. Midnight behind the box. Yeah. Brown paper. <laughs> Christopher Lloyd going viral, getting old and going viral. And even one of the things that I think makes this my favorite film in the franchise is just seeing him more. Well, Christopher Lloyd in his career started to do some really interesting things. And I say interesting in a loose way. I don't mean necessarily artistic. Sure. I mean, things you wouldn't expect him to be in. So Piranha 3D, Piranha 3 Double D. He's also in that thing, uh, The Oogie Loves. I don't know what's coming out. It's a weird children's Teletubby musical type thing. Uh, yeah, it's very bizarre. Okay. Also, highly recommend everybody in Podmanity do this. Google, uh, I believe it's the narrative of Victor Karloch, K A R L O C H. Uh huh. It's uh, it's this. I guess I'll link to that. Why it's not? It's this puppetry thing that he does the voice for. Really? Yeah, it's this deep sea, um, deep sea kind of zombie horror thing. Weird. But it's all puppets. Wow, I don't know about any of that it's, stuff. It's I could have cited trailer. thirty things Christopher Lloyd did, and that's not. <laughs> well, it's not out yet. The trailer just leaked. Weird. Uh, I, I say leaked. The trailer just dropped. It's. Sure. Um, I can't think of the name of the company that's putting it together. I feel really bad. You'll find it we'll if you link. Google yeah, it. Though. That'll be great. And anyway, highly recommend checking that out because if you loved him in Piranha Three Double D, wait till you see him as a fucking puppet. <laughs> Elijah Wood as well. Second time working together. Wait, I think I have seen this. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'll look that up. So maybe not as many gallons of blood or as many boobs, but uh, still smarter about both of them. Yeah, it uses it rations them out a little bit better. I think I think that's its strong point. It also has this great idea about praying for forgiveness in advance, which I think is the logical conclusion of what happens there. Mm -hmm. You and I have often uh, mocked the the idea that you can just do bad things. Religion is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's where I'm going with that. (laughs) This is the point where people want to use their chapters. Uh huh. Um, No, I mean the idea that. You know, you and I, if we fuck up, we have to answer to each other, to humanity, to ourselves. Uh Uh, If religious people fuck up uh, very often, I mean, that's what their goddamn book says. They can just uh, pray for forgiveness and then it's fine. Sure. And there's really nothing you can do except deny the Lord that he will not forgive you for, again, according to the Bible itself. So you just, you know, rape, pillage, murder, steal, uh, do anything you want and ask for forgiveness. Sure. In Piranha, we preemptively go, oh, yeah, we're definitely going to fuck. Also an impulsive thing, which is weird. So Uh this is very premeditated uh, sinning that's going on here. We're going to fuck here. We're going to do it very sinfully in this incredibly tacky shag rug van. Fucking shag rugs, man. Um, I just wanted to uh, phone in first God and just uh, let you know about it. I'm sure you'll be fine with it, but, you know, this is just a little preemptive in case I don't get to praying later. I'm going to be home a little bit late tonight, God. Yeah, right. Or in case I die in the van. I guess it's a good thing they did that. It doesn't matter because there's no God, even in the Piranha universe. It certainly didn't save their ass. So there you have it. In fact, the only thing that saves your ass in the Piranha universe is David Hasselhoff one out of 1,000 times. (laughs) Yeah, that worked pretty well, didn't it? Uh, he, He saved one kid. 
and that kid ended up getting himself killed. Sure. Um, I don't always go for the the cheeky cameo, look who we've got. Yeah. But man, Hasselhoff, they awesome. Nails it in this yeah. movie. This is, this is... Every second he's on the screen is awesome. I really am a little bit ashamed of how much I love David Hasselhoff. I'm I ashamed it, for you. I think it goes along with the same reason I love William Shatner. Mm -hmm. I love these relics of bad television. Sure. Who come back... And in their old age, when they just don't look, because especially Shatner and Hasselhoff are great examples because they were particularly popular for being gorgeous men. Yeah, that's especially hard to believe with Shatner. Sure. It's, I they, have trouble. I, I just can't. They both come back and they're kind of parodies of themselves already. Sure. But you could try to come back and reinvent yourself as a as a new face with the same old talent. Um, Say, I don't know, Leonard Nimoy. Yeah. Or you can go their route and go, yeah, we blew it. <laughs> we are total messes. Yeah. We will take anything we can get. I just want a hamburger. <laughs> right. Uh, so perfect in this. Post credits. So perfect. <laughs> I just, I want that TV show. I do. So I do I. That. And that uh, ends our adventure through the Pinata films. So we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. The only website you need this time is donate.doublefeatureshow.com. For those who chaptered, uh, we'll see if I can get through this in two sentences or less. You ready? The idea is we got a huge lexicon of terminology we use for double feature that we know and love sure. and want to share tom, with people. Tom. You know, you've heard us say it, you hate it. We, we want to put it on the website permanently for everyone to see, and we've decided to give that as an incentive for the people who donate as a thank you to the whole community. Small segment of the community does awesome things. Entire community benefits. And by entire, I mean seven people who listen and Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie, by the way, has never donated a red fucking cent to the show. Uh, you believe that? that motherfucker. See, this is why we have to do this. If Rob Zombie would donate once, then we'd be fine. Mm -hmm. But I want all you guys to know, uh, Busy Making Lords of Salem or whatever, doesn't donate Already a fucking... Already moving on to the next movie not before a penny, donating. Not a penny to this show god as much as we uh we talk them up too we're not actually sure. even we're not in the pocket well, of big much, zombie how much have show. we donated to rob zombie <laughs> at this point uh anyways before rob zombie gets mad and unsubscribes uh donate.doublefeatureshow.com we count on the normal people like us only by comparison to rob zombie are we the normal <laughs> people to uh fund the show and to fund these fucking awesome th i'm so excited to start talking about the things oh yeah by next killapalooza i hope we have the whole lexicon up and we can start diving into I want to make an announcement about the first fucking thing we're going to do. It's going to be awesome. Donate.doublefeatureshow.com and thank you in advance. Um, the movies we're going to do on the show next time are also pretty awesome. Yeah, next time uh, we're going to do a weird dad thing. We're going to do Real Steel and World's Greatest Dad. Oh, and doublefeatureshow at gmail.com for oh, yeah. all the things that we said to do something. Watch more fucking film. Bye.